Obviously, we want to bring more biodiversity, but first we really had to bring life back. We actually had to dig the holes and bring, I mean, wood chips, compost, uh, to get some, some sort of soil for these uh, plants to grow. Because there was mostly barren rock, I mean, red rock. You can still see on one of the sides of the peak how it used to be. And then where we started to plant, you can see that now everything is green and actually plants can, can actually grow there and survive there. Obviously, we picked only endemic species uh, because those we were sure would adjust to the kind of climates. And for us, this was in a way a mixed project because it was not just about restoring life and with its biodiversity, but also to provide security for the people living down uh, by the sea. Because the problem is large rocks, and Madeira is basically a large rock, crack. And when they crack into smaller bits and there's heavy rain, they just roll down the hill. Uh, and obviously they bring destruction to, to cities below. The thing we decided from day one that we will do differently is that we will not just plant we would plant and care afterwards. Caring about making sure that whatever amount of plants that we were putting on the ground, they would succeed. Throughout the years, we had uh, years where we planted uh, eight to 9,000 plants each winter. Biodiversity, when people think about it, it's not just about uh, having more species of plants. What does it mean to have more species of plants? Well, maybe a certain bird feeds only on a certain kind of plant. And if he doesn't fly, find that kind of plant in an area, he just moves away. The larger is the diversity of plants that we have on the ground uh, from our experience, the larger is also the, the number of uh, animal species that we find uh, nearby. After the last big fire that we had on our grounds, which was in 2010, I mean, suddenly, I mean, I think that was the worst part. Everything was silent. I mean, really silent. Here, no, no birds shipping. You, I mean, no uh, buzzing or anything. I mean, there was no sound. And everything was, obviously, the landscape was black. Uh, so it was a really sad sight and uh, it was really confusing to, to be on that silence. But then one day uh, in spring, on the first spring after that, uh, we had lots of cuts of those uh, burned woods that we were removing so we could start planting from, from, from zero. And we were turning all those burned woods in, into wood chips. So we brought the machine to do that. And um, we had a line of people putting all that uh, woods to... And then suddenly when we stopped for a while for a pause, we hear some, um, some birds shipping and we could not really realize from where it was because there were no trees, uh, nothing uh, that survived. And we... so we started to look inside the piles of wood chips. And there we find a small nest of blackbirds. So we find four babies that were living there and we decided to move from there to let them grow. And suddenly we realized that life was coming back, even in the worst of situations that was possible. The kind of forest that Madeira has is special for most Europeans because this is the kind of forest that you had at your doorstep a few thousand of years ago. In a way, when I saw that and decided to move to the islands, one of the things was, um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm working here, is that I didn't want the island to turn in the same thing where I used to live before. Because, I mean, for me, uh, just moving from place to place to get away from environmental destruction, you cannot spend the, all your life doing that, every now and then just moving, because things are no longer uh, nice for you. So instead I decided to be proactive and decided to work towards keeping things in the same stage. Uh, that's why I joined the association and we worked towards, I mean, putting pressure on politicians so that they take the correct, um, correct measures and follow the, the right policies. Not that it always works, but I mean, if we don't try, um, it's going to be even worse. And obviously not just talking, also doing, coming, I mean, on the weekends to to do these projects, try to, to, 
turn the, the, the land into something nice, not just concrete and tarmac. And, um, and I think biodiversity is important for all those reasons, but also for us to be happy. I mean, to find nature around us, because uh, it's a bit like uh, when you have an invasive species like those eucalyptus, which can just take um, uh, the, over all the land and not let any other species grow next to them, because they take all the resources, all the water, all the, um, the nourishments, that they will take everything so nothing grows around them. Um, and obviously that's not good. You can look and it's still green, but it's just one kind of green. And, um, and obviously, apart from all the dangers that we get from, from the, uh, when we go into, uh, let's say, uh, a mono species, it's, uh, people tend to call them forests, but actually they are not forests. It's just a place where you have trees planted. It's not really a forest, because a real forest, I mean, has many kinds of plants, has animals, and where um, water comes from the sources, and, um, and let's say the, the nature actually works. So I would not say that Madaran trees are more resistant to, to fire than not. Uh, unfortunately, when they get fire, they burn and they die, uh, just like the other ones. They are more resistant because the environment where they grow naturally, it's more humid, more damp, and so the conditions are not so good for fires to spread. Now, oil is, uh, I mean, like the most important thing we need it for energy and we don't think so much about water well here on Madeira Highland we don't think so much about water but when you look at um, a globe of the same latitude if you start going east the first thing you find is Morocco you find the Atlas Desert then you find Egypt again you find desert and then you find the Middle East you've got Syria and then you got Mongolia and again you find more desert in the Gobi and eventually you find Japan, which is not so much because Japan has a long tradition uh, of forestry and for thousands of years they, they, they really add in their culture to, I mean, keeping, taking good care of their forests. So they're the exception. Then you move on to America after the Pacific. And again, that's where you find Arizona and Texas and everything, more, more desert. So, but that is an exception, and it's an exception because it was lucky in a way. Because the island was, let's say, geographically goes from east, uh, from east to west, not north south. You look at the, de at the desertish islands, which, I mean, are 90 degrees. Uh, they are not parallel time. To, to Madeira and you can see that there actually nothing grows because there really it has nothing holding the winds that come from, from the north and um, like here and obviously it has no vegetation then to collect all this humidity that would bring life to the island. Uh, here Madeira has those conditions uh, precisely because because of that uh, because it has trees it has plants that collect that water that I mean, it's deposited underground. Um, and I think that water, in a way, is going to be the, let's say, the gold of, of the future. Because, uh, as I say, it's very easy here, but there's places in the, in, the, in the planet where people have to go walk kilometers every day to get a few buckets of water. Just many times, not really proper uh, clean water, but that's what they can have and manage to live with and um, it's amazing the amount of water that goes around the world in plastic bottles because people don't drink from the taps uh, when it's so easy to filter the water and uh, because people keep forgetting that um, the water industry actually doesn't produce any water, of course. That we bottles. have to leave it to the weather. <laughs> they just produce bottles. That's really what they, they produce. But that island should not need to import a single bottle of water. We have plenty of it and very good. Uh, so it doesn't make any sense. Biodiversity uh, is called here because the kind, the kind of forests that actually in a way are a guarantee that 
life, human or any other life, will have uh, uh, success here, it's because uh, we have this kind of forest. We had uh, three, we have one there, which is endemic, but they don't see there. A native plant, most knowledgeable people on the island would say that uh, we were making a mistake by trying to bring them back to the, um, to the heights of the island. Uh, because there they will not survive uh, in those conditions. But very close to Pico do Arieiro, there is um, a peak that gets the name from this actual tree. And where diggings found very large uh, roots from these trees. Nowadays there's not a single tree there. So you, you may ask, why do they call the, the hill? I mean, this when you don't find a single tree there. But that's the reason there used to be lots of, to, of those trees there. Uh, so we started to plant them and, well, tough luck. The first small baby plants that we put on the ground seemed like they were not going to succeed. It seemed like all those people that were just getting on our nerves were right after all. But then, as I told you, I liked to do things and understand them. And while every week when I was going there, I would try to understand why they were not doing so well. And eventually I found that the winds, very strong winds, would just move these plants aside. And then the, the air, the oxygen, will get to the roots. And eventually they will just start getting yellow and eventually die. So we had a, a lot of uh, eucalyptus we broke down there with, and with, um, with the shots of the eucalyptus I, uh, we made, we start making poles and we attached with string the, 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 these little cedars, the juniperus uh, cedars, that's the, the scientific name, attaching them to these poles so they would be steady and then suddenly there were growing I mean quite well and this I mean was uh, I didn't see it written anywhere I discussed it with with the other people in the group and um, again we 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 put our talks together and see it didn't mean that it was going to work but you could see what was the reason why it was not working so we decided to try a solution it worked and nowadays we already have with seven, eight years old, we already have some trees that go three, four meters above ground. They are taller than us. And that means that after all, it made sense. So this is really, in a way, an advice that I, I give to everyone that is trying to, to start doing these kind of things. Is learn a lot, as much as you can, about what you're doing. Don't just do what other people tell you, because of that. Try to get your interest, your heart and your brain into what you're doing and try to learn as much as you can. Plants from the space, same species that we planted there are showing up outside our plantation areas. Means that nature is already working. Again, also plants that we never planted, that are endemic, native, suddenly are showing up in our plantation areas. Meaning two things, that as we bring, let's say, a bit of normality to, to the land, it adjusts itself and it starts to take, uh, in a way, the chances that we provide with this work to, to restore uh, and to bring back species that you didn't see in the past, birds that you didn't see for many years, this is really not about the causes or if it's natural or not. It means we have to adjust and we have to work together to adjust because, I mean, we're in this, uh, in this barge, let's say, all together and if it sinks, we sink all together. So we better work together to the solutions and who cares about the problem? The problem is there. What we have is to learn and to do, not just talk, is two things that will let us go through this to the next time it happens again, 25 years into the future. Mm -hmm. Hopefully if we're there. I'm optimistic, you know. <laughs>